Welcome everyone. My name is Kevin Oshiro, and I am a member of the Application Engineering Group at MathWorks. The objective of this example is to provide you an overview of how to develop and implement hybrid electric vehicle control strategies. I will go over three topics in this example. First, I'll cover a control systems overview and the concept of energy management. Next, we'll go through detailed control algorithm implementation using a P2HEV as an example. And finally, I'll cover testing and simulating the controller and best practices. Let's start this presentation by going over an abstraction of the control architecture for a hybrid electric vehicle. Shown in this diagram are the different layers that exist in an HEV control architecture. The highest layer is the system level. The hybrid control module in this layer is also known as the supervisory controller. The next layer is the component level layer. This consists of the component level control modules, uh, including the engine control module, the transmission control module, um, if your HEV contains a transmission, motor controller, which is part of the inverter, and the battery management system. These component level modules are connected to the hybrid control module by one or more controller area network buses. Also, there are many other modules not shown for brevity. In this example, the focus will be on the supervisor controller. The supervisory controller will determine the operating modes of the system, uh, for example, EV mode versus parallel hybrid mode. It also coordinates and issues the control commands to the actuators in the system, uh, such as the engine and the motor, and it also contains other functions for system level control, such as power management and regenerative braking. Inside the system or component level controllers, there will be a software layer scheme where there is an input layer, application layer, and output layer. You will see the scheme used later in the example when we look at a powertrain block set HEV reference application model. The input and output, or I.O. layers, will typically contain blocks to support a model-in-loop, software-in-loop, or hardware-in-loop workflow, uh, such as rate transitions, hardware driver blocks, or receiving and transmitting CAN messages. We will focus specifically on the application layer of the hybrid supervisory controller in this example. Another common concept you will hear on the topic of hybrid control is managing the battery state of charge, or SOC. There are two major types of battery charge management schemes, charge depleting and charge sustaining. In charge depleting scheme, uh, the battery SOC degrades over a drive cycle. This is typical for a battery electric vehicle and you would have to recharge the battery by plugging it into a charger. In a charge sustaining scheme, the battery SOC is maintained over the course of a drive cycle. This is typical for a non-plug-in hybrid electric vehicle or ones without a stationary charging mode it ensures that you never drain your battery too deeply. Uh, also, for evaluation purposes of non-plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, it is typical to want the Delta SOC to be near zero over a specified drive cycle so that you can compare the fuel energy usage uh, directly to a similar non-HEV vehicle. For HEVs with plug-in capability, also known as PHEVs, you can combine the charge deplete and charge sustaining schemes. When the battery is full, the control strategy will allow extended EV-only operation in order to extend the vehicle's all-electric range. Um, or in some cases, uh, a, a blended strategy is used um, in which you use more battery power than from the engine. When the battery SOC gets to a certain threshold, the controller will transition into a charge sustaining scheme. I will refer to these charge deplete and charge sustaining concepts later in the presentation. Now I want to discuss the concept of energy management which is the most important part of controlling HEVs. Energy management entails instantaneously controlling the power of the actuators in the system. For example, in this P2 HEV example, for a given power demand from the driver, how should the power between each actuator, um, being the engine and the electric machine, be split? The power split decision also drives the operating mode selection of this hybrid. Uh, for example, clutch open, will be the electric vehicle mode versus clutch closed being the parallel mode. It is trying to accomplish all of these decisions while subject to many constraints. For example, the actuators will have speed, torque, or power constraints. Uh, the energy management algorithm also has to account for managing the state of charge of the battery. The energy management controller can also attempt to minimize energy consumption and maintain drivability of the vehicle. Performing energy management control is a very difficult task, one that is subject to enormous amount of research in academia and industry. There are two major types of energy management control, 
optimization-based, and role-based. I want to discuss two of the more well-known optimization-based energy management methods. The first is dynamic programming, or DP. DP consists of having a discretized steady-state model, which is solved numerically backwards in time, over a predefined drive cycle, uh, meaning you have to know the drive cycle beforehand. This means it is a non-causal method and is not real-time implementable in a real control system. But the results can be made into rules, which you implement in lookup table form. In theory, DP produces the global optimum solution over a drive cycle, so it is the baseline of how energy efficient an HEV is given the constraints of the system. The next method is the Pontryagin Minimum Principle, or PMP, and the Equivalent Consumption Minimization Strategy, or ECMS. These are analytical, instantaneous optimization methods. PMP and ECMS can produce near-optimal solutions if the drive cycle is already known. To make these methods more robust for real-world conditions where the drive cycle is not known beforehand, adaptive methods are being researched. The idea of ECMS is that you minimize the equivalent fuel consumption of the system, which is made up of the engine fuel and virtual fuel consumption from the battery. An equivalent factor, denoted by the letter S, which has separate factors for discharging and charging, converts electrical power to an equivalent fuel consumption. ECMS and PMP are deemed to be equivalent methods if ECMS is structured in terms of power. Um, this is done by multiplying both sides of the original ECMS equation by the lower heating value of fuel. These optimization-based techniques are a very broad and deep topic. Due to the introductory nature of this presentation and the limited time of this video, I cannot adequately cover the optimization-based methods with the necessary detail that they deserve. I would also recommend having some exposure to graduate level optimization classes before studying these methods. For more information, I would like to recommend the following resources. Um, first is an IEEE paper titled Review of Optimization Strategies for System Level Design in Hybrid Electric Vehicles by Silvas and co-authors. This is a comprehensive paper covering many HV optimization methodologies. The list of references included in the paper is extensive. Uh, the second resource I would like to recommend uh, is the following textbook titled Hybrid Electric Vehicles Energy Management Strategies by Onori, Sarau, and Rizzoni. Um, you'll probably recognize those three authors' names uh, because they have published many papers on this subject. This book covers DP, PMP, and ECMS methods in detail. Every chapter also includes a nice list of references. This is one of the most comprehensive books on the subject and is a great read. Um, and for your information, I am not affiliated with any of these authors, but I enjoyed their work. The energy management method that I will discuss in detail for the remainder of this example is known as a role-based method. This means rules are based on heuristics or engineering experience or knowledge. An example of a role-based strategy is shown here in this figure. The operating modes of this HEV is set by regions based on wheel speed and requested torque at the wheels. Even though a rule-based controller can't guarantee optimal results, there are several benefits, including uh, it provides a good introduction to the concepts of energy management. The idea of these examples in general is to provide the foundation for you to implement and conduct your own model-based design process. Uh, that means you will need a real-time implementable control algorithm. Uh, rule-based controls work robustly over a wide range of operating conditions and drive cycles without prior information and maintains drivability of the vehicle. Uh, it can realistically switch operating modes using actuators, uh, and all real controllers have some role-based elements inside them. Uh, in a later example, I will go over an offline optimization method to optimize the boundaries of the operating modes over multiple drive cycles to help improve the energy efficiency. Let's now go into the details of the HEV supervisory control implementation. In the powertrain block set HEV reference applications, Rule-based control algorithms are provided. They are implemented in Simulink and Stateflow and are real-time implementable. The idea is you can use these control models as templates and customize them for your needs. Let's go into a P2 HEV example so I can show you where the controller is located. From the main MATLAB window, um, extract the HEV examples zip file and then go into the HEV P2 underscore R2018A folder. And please read the README file first. Essentially what it says is to go into the main folder, 
to double click on the hevp2.prj file, that's a Simulink project file, and that's going to set up all the folders um, that are needed to run this model. Then if you go into the system folder, you can click on the hevp2 reference application model, and it will open the model. And for this presentation, we're going to spend time looking in the controllers system. Uh, note here is that input, output, and application layer uh, that I spoke of earlier. If we go into the application layer, um, we'll see that there are um, systems or controllers for the engine control module. Uh, there's a separate transmission control module. And here is the hybrid control module, which we'll be um, going into detail. And if you double click on that, uh, the reference model will open uh, for the P2 powertrain controller. And uh, for the remainder of this presentation, we will spend time and I will go through the details of the implementation of this controller. The hybrid control module has the following major functions. They are a supervisory or energy management controller, which is implemented in state flow a function that converts the driver uh, accelerator pedal to requested system torque, regenerative brake blending, a simplified battery management system which is used for a power management algorithm. Uh, the supervisory and energy management function changes for different HEV architectures. We reuse the other functions with minimal changes. For this example, there's also no plug-in capability, so strict charge sustaining is needed. I will go over each of these functions in detail. The supervisory rule-based algorithm comes from this SAE paper titled Optimization of Electrified Powertrains for City Cars uh, by Andreas Balaz and co-authors. We use this paper because it was requested by one of our commercial customers to investigate it. The first rule is the power threshold for pure electric driving. This parameter is denoted as K1. If the power demand is less than K1, then EV mode is used. If the power demand is greater than K1, parallel hybrid uh, mode is used. This is a pretty common heuristic found in role-based controllers. Most internal combustion engines' um, optimal operating line, uh, which is the torque versus speed line that has minimum fuel consumption, occurs at higher torque and power values. So operating at lower power demands in EV mode is acceptable. The next rules are based on these equations. The first equation calculates an optimal state of charge based on the kinetic energy of the vehicle. It allows the SOC of the battery to drop more at higher vehicle speeds because the potential of recapturing energy through regenerative braking is increased. The next equation calculates the engine power based on the power demand and the difference of the SOC optimal uh, and the SOC actual multiplied by a controller parameter denoted as K2. The second part of that equation I call charge power, and K2 will become a control parameter that is adjusted to help optimize the power split. I redefine the engine power equation to be P of the engine is equal to P of the demand minus P charge, uh, where P charge is now negative K2 times the difference of the SOC optimal uh, and SOC actual. P charge is what gets sent to the electric machine, or PEM. If P charge is negative, um, because SOC actual is less than SOC optimal, negative power command will go to the electric machine and act as a generator because charging is needed. A negative P charge will increase the power uh, of the engine, or PICE, to compensate for the extra load from the machine. If P charge is positive, because SOC actual is greater than SOC optimal, positive power command will go to the electric machine and act as a motor, because discharging is needed. Since the electric machine is supplying power, uh, the P of the engine is reduced. Later, I will show that the P engine command is sent to a lookup table containing the optimal operating line, and the engine will attempt to run on that line. Uh, since the engine is coupled to the wheels through the transmission and drive line, it may not operate exactly on that line, uh, depending on the current gear ratio. Also, the ETA term uh, in the SOC optimal calculation equation is supposed to represent the efficiency of converting the vehicle's kinetic energy. But through experimentation, I found that adjusting this factor can help the controller charge sustain better. So it becomes a controller parameter that is adjusted to help minimize delta SOC. 
Here are where two of the rule control parameters are located in the control model. Uh, the eta term uh, is denoted as the charge sustaining factor. And K2 is now denoted as the SOC charge factor. It is based on vehicle speed as to not run the electric machine as a generator to improve drivability at lower speeds. If we go inside the state flow chart and into the operating mode state, we can see the charge power calculations are located here. There are two discrete driving modes, EV and parallel HEV. Um, just for abbreviation's sake, it's denoted as PHEV uh, in the chart shown. The embedded Simulink functions engine on request controls the transition between EV and parallel HEV modes. The control parameter K1 is located in this function. The P2 architecture uh, lends itself to a stationary charging mode. Um, this is where the P2 clutch is closed and the transmission is either in neutral or its own internal clutch is open. Um, this is controlled with a manual switch in the driver subsystem. The power split equation for the internal combustion engine and electric machine is located in the parallel HEV state uh, inside this embedded simulating function. The top portion of the model is the equation of the power of the engine equals the power of the demand minus um, the charge power. The bottom of the model has an adjustment term for the power of the electric machine. If there is a situation where the torque command is greater than the engine torque output, the electric machine will provide extra power assistance. Now I'm going to discuss how the engine power demand is implemented. An optimization algorithm was used to find the minimum brake specific fuel consumption line. Uh, this is also known as the optimum operating line. The output was placed into lookup tables. In stationary charging mode, um, which is shown uh, here, uh, for a given engine power command, the optimal engine torque command is sent to the engine controller um, in open loop uh, fashion, and the engine speed command is sent to the electric machine, and this is a, uh, going to a closed loop PID control. So the engine can operate exactly on the minimum operating line. In parallel HEV mode, the engine torque command is sent to the engine controller, um, but depending on the transmission gear at that instant, uh, it is not guaranteed to always operate on the line. This is a, uh, an example of combining an optimization result with role-based control. Now I want to discuss the implementation details of starting the engine. In this example, the P2HEV retained its low voltage starting motor. So the engine can be started in different ways depending on its mode. In stationary mode, the P2 machine can start the engine if the P2 clutch is closed and transmission is in neutral or its internal clutch is open. If the high voltage battery SOC is low, the 12 volt starter can be used. While driving and transitioning from EV to parallel hybrid mode, the 12 volt starter can be used to crank the engine um, and the P2 clutch must be open. The engine will go into a speed control mode to match speeds on both sides of the P2 clutch before it is closed. This type of logic is implemented in state flow in the engine control starting state. There are alternative ways to start the internal combustion engine. It is possible to close the P2 clutch directly. Um, this is also known as a bump start if transitioning from EV to parallel hybrid mode. Um, however, it can cause a driveline disturbance depending on the speed differential across the P2 clutch, uh, the inertia of the internal combustion engine, and the torque required to overcome the engine's compression. It is also possible to shuffle the clutches. Um, this would entail opening the transmission clutch or going into neutral, um, closing the P2 clutch, starting the engine with the P2 motor, uh, matching the speeds using the P2 motor, and closing the transmission clutch um, or re-engaging the gear. This process can take uh, as long as 400 to 500 milliseconds as seen in the graph. Um, there's a drop in vehicle speed because there is no attractive torque to the wheels during the start sequence. And when tractive torque resumes, the vehicle speed is off target, um, so the virtual driver overcompensates. As a note, I personally like to look at these type of situations when evaluating HEV architectures because a large part of developing an HEV is that it does exhibit good drivability characteristics. Since we have dynamic models of the actuators and components in the system, it is beneficial to study how long it takes to switch modes and how that affects the vehicle's drivability and energy consumption. These type of studies can be a factor when evaluating different HEV topologies. Let's now discuss the function which converts the accelerator pedal to torque. 
The accelerator pedal signal is originating from the virtual driver block and has a range of 0 to 1. We use the max motor torque versus speed and optimal engine torque curve and add them together to get a combined torque. The accelerator pedal signal is then multiplied to this combined torque. Um, of note, for this P2 example, the internal combustion engine and electric machine torque can be added together because they are providing torque on a common shaft. In other HEV architectures, the actuators will not be at a common location, so you should reflect their output torques to a common location, um, typically the wheels, before adding them together. Note that the torque command output goes to the state flow chart. Uh, in the chart, the torque is multiplied by speed to calculate the power demand. Now let's discuss the regenerative braking control function. The purpose of regenerative braking algorithm is to recapture as much kinetic energy as possible. An example of a blending algorithm is used, where the motor regen braking torque and mechanical friction braking torque have to be controlled together. First, an estimated braking torque at the wheels is done by using the brake pedal request, um, which is a brake pressure, and first principle disc brake equations, which are shown here. The max motor regen braking torque is calculated using the max motor torque versus speed curve and is re reflected to the wheels by using the overall gear ratio of the transmission uh, and differential gear. There is a low speed uh, and SOC based charge limit cutoffs as well. Any brake torque requests that cannot be provided by uh, motor regen braking will be sent to the friction disc brakes. And the last detailed implementation uh, function I want to discuss is power management. Power management attempts to keep the instantaneous battery power within the dynamic discharge and charge power limits of the battery. Typically, a battery management system, uh, or BMS, dictates the amount of discharge or charge power depending on the conditions of the battery, such as state of charge or temperature. This algorithm uh, converts the mechanical torque request to a power request then calculates the electrical power request using an efficiency map. It checks if the electric power request is within the dynamic uh, BMS power limits. If it is within the limit, it will allow the original mechanical power request uh, through. If the limit is exceeded, it uses the upper limit for the electrical power request and converts an allowable mechanical power and torque request using the efficiency map. The graph here uh, shows a 0 to 60 mile per hour acceleration test. Note that the instantaneous battery power is more or less bounded in the battery limits from the battery BMS. This is a conservative safety algorithm uh, and it helps ensure that the dynamic power limits from the BMS aren't exceeded. Now that we discussed the detailed control function implementation, I want to discuss testing the controller. It is important to frequently test any new control algorithm you create. Couple the physical HEV model and HEV system level controller together. The powertrain blocks at templates already do this. Use the full system level model for early closed loop control development. And I like to test my controllers over many different drive cycles at different initial uh, battery SOC values. I use a script to run 30 of the drive cycles from the drive cycle source block with six different initial battery SOC points to see how robust the controller is. Here are example results from the P2 HEV model at different initial battery state of charge points over a drive cycle. Uh, this drive cycle is FTP72. The figures on the left are for an initial battery SOC of 10%, the center figures for 60%, and the right figures for 100%. The vehicle should, uh, should track the reference signal closely. The engine and motor speeds and torques should not exceed their maximum values or oscillate. Power or current shouldn't exceed the limits. And battery SOC should exhibit the following behavior. Uh, if you start with a low initial SOC, the state of charge should increase over time and stabilize around the target SOC. In this example, the target SOC is 60%. If you have a high initial SOC, then the state of charge should decrease and stabilize around the target SOC. And if the initial SOC is the target SOC, then the delta SOC should be minimal, as shown in the center figure. And the miles per gallon equivalent should produce results uh, with results higher than a conventional powertrain. Finally, I want to highlight some best practices for developing HEV controls. 
Use the powertrain block set uh, reference applications as a starting point. Organize functions into subsystems and unit test them. Use reference models and variant subsystems where appropriate. Use embedded Simulink or MATLAB functions within state flow states to streamline the model. Combine aspects of both rule-based and optimal control where you can. And test new functions in a closed loop uh, with this vehicle model. This concludes the introduction to developing and implementing HEV control algorithms. We covered an overview of HEV control systems and the concept of energy management, reviewed the detailed control algorithm implementation in Simulink and Stateflow, and testing the controller and best practices. I would recommend reviewing the P2HEV hybrid control module on your own. In my personal experience, developing HEV control algorithms to do energy management while still maintaining good drivability of the vehicle is the biggest challenge in HEV design. It is where I spend most of my time when developing these closed loop system level models. Thank you again for watching this presentation. Please watch the next example on how to conduct HEV design optimization exercises. One of the examples is an offline optimization technique to improve the rule-based controller shown in this presentation.